And Diane, could you call roll? Commissioner Gibson? Here. Commissioner Gorman? Here. Commissioner McCarthy? Commissioner McEwen? Here. Commissioner Panetta? Here. Commissioner Schmidt? Here. And Commissioner Spangler? Here. I'd like to call on Karen. To, uh, she's going to give us a presentation on what they've been up to. And, and just judging from the emails I get every morning, you guys have been busy still. Sorry, Karen, you're muted. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and start presenting as soon as Shannon's ready. Oh, here comes, here comes Dennis. <laughs> so welcome commissioners. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And we're going to give you a Parks and Recreation Department update. Tonight, we will share with you the Parks and Recreation operations from July through September. We'll be talking about reopening and preparing for the new normal. We'll discuss some additional considerations and next steps, open it up for public comment, and then questions and answers by the Parks and Recreation Commission. And I think Louie's gonna be our first presenter with Park Division Operations. Okay, so, um, are there, there supposed to be pictures to go with this or? Do I explain these first? You could, you could lead into them a little bit. Okay. Um, Park Division of Landscaping Projects. Uh, uh, we've re-landscaped Griffin, Seminole Plaza, Ferrani Park, um, among others. And you'll see Schultz Park later on, Schultz Park. Uh, new irrigation of the cemetery. That's the final phase, phase three of the cemetery. So it's all automated now. No more plug-in sprinklers. Uh, Veterans Park Campground is open and operational. Uh, albeit we're still um, following the protocols, trying to keep the social distancing up. Um, landscaping maintenance in all city parking lots, 379 hours so far. Dry grass and weed removal in city parks. Um, I think this was our best year for greenbelt fuel reduction that since I've been here. Um, and Justin will explain more of that later on. Um, and 30 large transient camps removed. This is becoming a bigger and bigger uh, time concern for us in parks. Um, so there's the Moonris. That's the last one that we have just completed the island right in front of Castle Moonris. Um, we replaced the landscaping there. Went with a lot of succulents on that one. Um, it's a kind of a high traffic area, kind of the interway into Alvarado Street too. Lagunita Mirada and Washerman's Pond dredging. There is the Moonless Island right there. It'll all grow in real nice. Looks pretty wide open right now. Um, the dredging project, uh, Washerwoman's went a lot smoother than La Mirada. Um, that doesn't look very pretty right there. Um, in the future, it's gonna look much better. Um, it may not be fully completed this year, it's about 55% right now, um, but it will look much better. Get some water back in that and it's gonna look great. There'll be a lake there again. A lot of mud. Washwoman's much easier. Um, they found some dry spots that they can work in there real easy. Um, that one I believe is all the way complete right now. And, and Louis, this is a big project, looks like one, one million dollar uh, project, is correct? Yes. Um, there may be some additional costs if it runs over uh, time wise. Uh, 
Schultz Park. This was the final phase of an NIP project. It was, I believe, phase four. Uh, this was to replace the old um, stucco wall, which was really hollow and rotten. And we replaced it with the wrought iron fence. And I think uh, your commission was very instrumental on in getting the wrought iron fence instead of a solid wall. I think it looks fantastic. Um, you can see the building behind it. You can see the turf areas. It's all landscape now. It looks really good. It's going to look much better as the landscape grows in. Uh, I think this is a great improvement. And uh, thank you for uh, pushing for that wrought iron fence because I think it makes all the difference in the world. This is a fun one here. Um, park's been closed, so we haven't had a chance to. This is the boat project that's been going on for four years. Uh, finally got it installed. Um, I think it's nice. Um, we'll have to see what the kids think about it when it gets there. So it's a concrete boat um, with a, a climbing net on the back few interesting little things to play with and a bunch of hop rocks in the shape of sea or uh, saw, uh, starfish, seals, and rocks. So it'll, it'll be fun. It replaced a boat that was did not look like a boat. It was a really big project. It was 30,000 pounds to be brought in and it wasn't easy. Uh, they did a really nice job. And it's a unique piece of plane equipment. It was one of a kind built especially for us. Um, that is Karen's idea right there. I think that came out really well. <laughs> we named the boat, so. This is, uh, this project here is a project that we joined uh, with the, uh, a volleyball group, a local volleyball group that wanted to put in new posts for us in return for some um, prioritized play. Um, they put in eight by eight posts. We dug the holes for them. Um, it's going to come out really nice. Now they're going to put the nice professional type net hangers on there too. And caps on top of the poles. It's going to be really nice. We're, those are usually heavily used quartz too. So. And they put a piece of plywood on the bottom so it doesn't shift back and forth. And our volunteers in parks always do a great job. This is the sensory garden, which is their main garden. Um, notice the green bins full. We probably take about five or six of those back every time they're working on an area. This is around Colton Hall too. We need more, right? And then the parent magazine, Dennis Menace was their favorite park. I am gonna turn it over to Justin Prouty. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. This is only my second Parks and Rec Commission meeting I've ever been to. I think the first one I've really presented anything at. Um, so, uh, we completed our weed eating for the season, which is important. Um, this is kind of the height of our fire season right now, as you guys probably know with all the warm weather. Um, that involved 713 hours of CAL FIRE, uh, the inmate crews, um, we split that up between Huckleberry Hill, the old Capitol site, and the Skyline Greenbelt for the most part, um, just because those are the larger areas where we can accommodate those big crews. Uh, tree inspections, uh, 306, uh, 168 for the city, 138 in the Presidio, and 117 tree removal permits. Uh, it's kind of a busy time of year for us uh, for tree permits. People start planning for the winter. Uh, I'm going to get those trees out that might be hazardous. Um, we pruned or removed approximately 190 trees. Um, it's 125 in the city only 65 in the Presidio. Uh, we planted 30 trees, uh, 20 of which were part of a Boy Scout uh, Eagle project, or Eagle Scout project, I should say. Um, 
that's up in uh, parcel B. Uh, we're trying something new where they uh, planted these trees, uh, Monterey pines and oaks and these reservoirs that water them in for the first six months, supposedly. So it's kind of an experiment to see how it goes. And for the Presidio, again, we did fuel break projects for uh, the Presidio uh, along the Huckleberry Hill fence, uh, long needed uh, improvement. We've been managing the Huckleberry side for years uh, and the army, um, you know, with this kind of awful fire season decided it was time to uh, take care of their side of the fence. So improving safety for everybody. And then also down in Camp Roberts, where we do have some responsibility um, for the SATCOM uh, satellite top secret facility, whatever they do down there. Uh, just again, making a fire break and uh, improving that, which is strategically important for the US. And then we had another volunteer tree planting event. So our tree count will actually be up by 12. Um, this is a pretty great event. We were approached by uh, Tamiko, and uh, she wanted to, for her birthday party, uh, plant some trees uh, instead of having people buy her presents and things like that. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to organize, trying to keep uh, socially distant. She wanted to have a group of 20. Uh, we had to get her down to doing two shifts of 10 people, um, but they raised all the money uh, for the trees. It was 12 Monterey Cypress, it was about five hundred dollars um yeah they raised all the money for the trees we helped them out with a little bit of uh technical support um took them about six or seven hours on a saturday morning and uh it went pretty well so um that's at windows at the bay and you can see those new trees in there they've just been uh staked today and watered in and over the next couple of years they'll replace some of the ones we've lost over the, the past years Okay, back to me. Um, what's next for Monterey? Uh, retirement challenges. We had two retirements um, since February. Um, part-time staff or overtime. We like to keep. Uh, we like to get a couple part-timers on. We're going to run to JPA. Um, we're meeting on the 22nd to try to pick a uh, landscape group to do a master plan for the park. Streamlining and automating process. Uh, What's on board for us would be trying to go automated into Veterans Park and reopening playgrounds and or other park amenities um, as we have the staff to do it in accordance with the CDC. Uh, right now, we really can't uh, do it with what they're asking us to do. Okay, let me unmute myself so you can hear me. Um, so Monterey Recreation has been extremely busy um, in new ways. Um, we had to get creative fairly quickly with the, everything being shut down. Um, so right away, and you kind of might have heard about this at our last meeting, we started Operation Outreach um, with the direction from the city manager's office. And we worked with the library, the sports center, and um, in particular, the Schultze Park Center staff to reach out to uh, seniors who might be um, in their homes but not getting the social interaction that they were used to. So we made um, just under 6,000 calls. We had um, 2,600 individual contacts and we logged about um, 1,227 hours. Um, and this was as best as we could possibly count um, with, you know, a spreadsheet and logging time. I, I anticipate this number is probably hot greater because um, we did speak to some people multiple times. Um, and then we we had a lot of people call us as well. So it was a great program. Everyone was very appreciative. Um, we still reach out to people as needed. Um, when they call us, we respond. And when um, we bring something new on board, we try and make sure all the um, seniors hear about it as well. Um, one other thing that we have um, been doing is we've been in support of the Emergency Operations Center. 
um, since the very beginning with care and shelter was our uh, section that we're responsible for. And since March, that's been 614 hours in care and shelter. And that's all not, um, that's not just COVID, that is also wildfires. We had those wildfires that started in August and we geared up the EOC once again to respond to the wildfires and we opened um, and prepared our community centers to be temporary shelters. Uh, we also have a virtual recreation center um, that we send you all updates on quite regularly. Um, the virtual recreation center also includes some fee-based pro virtual programs, um, but it also includes lots of free activities. Every week we try and have something new. Um, there's always a weekly activity challenge. There's always um, some new recipe, um, so we'll talk more about that later. Um, we also have engaged in lots of community outreach because we have less of a physical presence, but much more of a virtual, and we're on social media trying to make sure we reach everyone in every way possible. Um, since this time, we've probably sent out 1.5 million emails, and we have a very good open rate of about 19% um, from anyone who has probably ever registered for a parks and recreation program. So Monterey Recreation has also hosted blood drives. We are um, at 395 units collected. We started a senior and family produce distribution and so far as through September have served 3,341 families and seniors. In August, we took our Meals on Wheels program, which used to be at the Schultze Park Center. Um, and people used to have congregate meals at the Schultze Center where everyone had lunch together, but obviously that can't be done right now. Um, so we changed it to a drive-through program where four days a week seniors can drive through and pick up a ready to serve meal um, that they can take home and enjoy later. And then um, in this time, we've also had to foster our partnerships. Uh, we've had relationships with these groups in the past, but they've really grown since then. Um, we've had um, partnerships with the Food Bank for Monterey County for produce distribution, American Red Cross, Meals on Wheels. And then we worked quite closely with the California Beach Volleyball Association Monterey to get that process started um, for those volleyball courts. So. Um, the agreement is in place, and then Louie and his crew took over for the installation. And then once those courts get to be open, we will hope to be able to um, generate some revenue by um, issuing per permits for use of those courts. And now we have uh, four dedicated courts with which will have their own nets, and they're called um, slider systems. And by slider systems, those nets will be able to be moved up and down um, for different ages and levels of play. So we hope to um, really, um, once it's safe to do so and those courts are reopened, generate some nice revenue by um, issuing permits for the, their use for group activities. So now we're gonna see a lot of just of our photos and our highlights of different things that we have done. So our virtual recreation center um, contains a photo reel, and these are just some highlights of some of our um, activities and our challenges. One thing that we have also done is we have um, a wonderful um, volunteer, Montana, who has created original cooking videos for us. So each week, Cooking with Montana debuts every Thursday, morning and i think we're right around 22 videos um, that he's produced for us um, so he does a variety of different activities um, recipes and demos and those are all unique to us and made just for monterey recreation so he's dedicated hours and hours and hours of his time to that we greatly appreciate it um, and then these are just some examples of our previous um, winners from our weekly challenges this was our chalk your walk And we get participants of all ages um, and abilities. Another one, which was um, Rainbows Over Monterey, and that was his version of a rainbow. And then we had a um, pizza challenge. 
And uh, how does your garden grow? And that was a very large, uh, the mom, their, her mom was extremely surprised that they were able to grow something quite so large. A lot of families have taken on home improvement projects and gardening projects and uh, have had family gardens that they never would have had before, except um, now they have the time. Um, and then an example of someone who took on the challenge and um, completely redid their yard, which is just amazing. And um, someone else who um, does artwork and submitted their entry for us. And then um, we had a week where it was thank your essential, essential workers, and this was right around the wildfires. And then um, keep your distance, we must, this is the way. So it's been really interesting. It, it's um, had a great response um, and we get participants from all different ages and all different backgrounds. And it really just depends on the week as to which activity speaks to um, that particular person. So our family and senior produce distribution is every Monday, um, and it is by reservation. That way we are able to control the traffic flow. Um, but what we hear from people is that that is a great opportunity because they don't have to wait in line. They just show up at their given appointment window and their food is ready for them and placed in their trunk. So uh, recreation staff arrives every day about every Monday about 8 a.m. and depending on the delivery, um, that may involve just um, hopefully just putting boxes in cars, but in this case, it was making our own boxes. So we were hustling um, and um, putting together unique boxes and bags for each individual car. We started June 29th with um, our first run was 88 individuals. We now are um, well over 350 a day every Monday. Um, our highest um, day was 422. Um, and then as you can see, it's not just produce, it's dairy, it's, um, we have some meat, um, it's dry goods, um, and everyone just loves it and is so appreciative. And we have, um, when school is not distance learning, we do have a great crew that comes and helps us. Um, but when they're in distance learning, we, we do it ourselves. <laughs> Um, and we stick everything in, in everyone's cars and we get to meet a wide variety of people and their pets and we really enjoy that and we have people that we see every week. Um, the next thing that we started with, again, like I mentioned earlier, are senior drive through meals on wheels and that's been great. The meals come every day, um, every Tuesday through Friday from the Meals on Wheels of the Monterey Peninsula. That's our delivery. Um, and then we portion it out, um, bag it up, and um, distribute it to, um, we're probably close to 60 seniors who are registered, and we average a little bit over 30 meals per day that go out. Um, so it's a great program. And again, we utilize the Elistero uh, Dennis and Menace parking lot as it's closed right now, and that's just the perfect location um, to get cars off the street, they circle around, and as they're about to leave, we put everything in their car. And it's masks are required, but it's um, really just kind of the safest way to do things at the moment. And then we've hosted Red Cross blood drives. Um, we've hosted 10, um, and they're in our main hall. And we're now considered a premier um, Blood Cross, um, Red American Red Cross partner. Um, because we are able to fill our slots every month. Um, when wildfires were happening, we actually had three days of blood drives back to back because we were able to accommodate um, everyone um, whose blood drives had gotten canceled um, because of the wildfires. Um, and so that's something that we hope to continue into the future because it's a great service. And the Red Cross really kind of just does everything that uh, really they just come in and use our space, which is great. And then Emergency Operations Center, um, really that main person who's handled that um, has been um, Nate Coda. He is our Karen Shelter Branch Chief. Um, this is here. And just so you know, that was 
photo was taken before face masks were even considered uh, mandated or necessary. So that's very early in the EOC when the EOC was actually opened in person and not virtually. Um, so Nate has been amazing. And um, no matter which situation, even if he's in his working from his garage, he's done um, amazing. And he really helped out as well when EOC geared back up for the wildfires. So this is very exciting, and I know we're supposed to be talking about activities um, from uh, July through September, but this week we opened preschool at Hilltop. That was our first um, in-person program that we were able to get off the ground. It does look different than what we've had in the past. It's now limited to 10 children. Um, we had to re kind of configure the preschool classroom. This is just half of it. We had to remove um, anything that was um, plush or soft or fabric, um, and things have to be sanitized quite often, but we um, can accommodate 10. We have nine enrolled at the moment, um, and they are just loving their first two days of preschool. Parents are getting a, getting a much needed three hour break. Um, and we were able to rehire our former um, PTS, uh, our lead preschool instructor, Michelle Aponce. Um, and she's just so excited to be back. Um, and we're so excited to have her. Um, so this is at Hilltop Park Center. Um, Michelle is our lead preschool instructor. And Rachel Dice is our coordinator at that site. Um, and they're just both doing amazing, amazing work, and we're just so excited to be doing what we love to do. Um, one other thing that's come up out of all of this is we've had to um, prepare for COVID, and those precautions and those guidelines change all of the time, and so um, we've had to put uh, um, acrylic shields at our centers, um, and get prepared for reopening. Um, we have a nifty little gadget called an electrostatic sprayer that we all have to get familiar with. Um, and that generates a, a very fine mist that will uh, disinfect, um, you know, um, any surface really. Um, and whatever it's on is effective um, or protected for about four days. So we're using that um, quite often before or after every event and for before preschool. And that's one thing that we've had to um, figure out is um, that's one of those things that isn't really in our budget. We've never had to have as many Clorox wipes and as much hand sanitizer and space guards and all these things that we have that um, are, are definitely gonna be challenged and, and as far as um, we can see, we don't know when that's going to end. So um, that's something that we're working with every single day. But when you work with people, you have to have the necessary supplies and equipment to make sure everyone is safe. So that is what we're doing. Um, so what's next for Monterey Recreation? We are hoping to empl uh, provide employee child care in the next couple weeks. Um, that's for City of Monterey employees who are um, trying to do distance learning at the same time as they're also trying to work. So we hope to bring that on board at the El Estero Park Center. Um, the room is ready. The outdoor space is ready. We're just waiting for the kids. Um, once we are able to move through the California uh, reopening tiers, right now we're in purple. The farther we go, um, we will be looking at permitting and regulating the outdoor use of city parks and beaches. Um, we've always regulated the outdoor use of city parks and beaches, but there's the added aspect of COVID. So there's COVID acknowledgements, there's um, waivers, there's more things that have to be added to that. We also need to take into account what specific activities people are doing and how many people are in each activity. Um, because um, even though we're moving through the tiers, that doesn't mean that um, COVID is not still happening. Um, so we still have to make sure that we try and maintain um, as much safe, um, safe spaces as we can. And as I talked about earlier, we are trying to figure out how we can reopen and when we can reopen. 
um, and what that will look like. Um, you know, we've kind of gotten our centers ready for a few programs, but as we know more, that means more hand sanitizer, more dispensers, more safety precautions, all of those things. Um, and every activity and every program is going to have its own guidelines depending on what we're doing. Is it indoors, outdoors? One other thing that we've had to deal with is, again, the wildfires. And for those of you that haven't heard, Toro Park um, did burn and it did burn pretty significantly. Um, and we have photos that uh, the wildfire burned right to the edge of the youth overnight area where we have Camp Kinsabi every summer. Um, and so we're gonna have to figure out what that means for Camp Kinsabi, what that means for Toro Park. Um, Toro Park is closed indefinitely, um, but we're hoping that, you know, with the conditions of the park and the city's budget that Camp Kinsabi could be a possibility for next summer, but we're also quite aware that it, it may not be safe to be be back at Toro. Um, lots of trees, lots of trees that had um, extensive damage and so our main concern would be safety of all the kids who don't just stay in the youth overnight area all day, they go on hikes and explore the park and if the park isn't safe to explore then maybe that isn't the best site for a camp program. So we'll be evaluating that as well. Um, El Estero and Schulte Park Center We'll also be polling places on November 3rd, and we will be staffing that. Um, polls open, I believe, at 7 a.m. and close at 8 o'clock. Um, and so recreation staff will make sure that those polls are available. Um, and then we will be bringing back ballpark advertising to city council on December 1st. Um, that was due to go to city council right when COVID hit. Um, it was on the agenda. Um, the agenda report had been approved and then it was pulled because we shut everything down. So we hope to bring that back to city council on December 1st and hopefully get a decision so that if there are um, softball and baseball sports with Monterey High this, um, this year, uh, that they will be able to advertise. One other thing that is coming up is the um, Pecos League. The Amberjacks are also interested in returning for summer of 2021. So that's just a few things, lots of other stuff happening, but that's the highlights. And then I'm going to turn it over to Andrea. Thank you, Shannon. Hi, everybody. It's great to see all of you. It's been a long time, so I'm um, very excited to see everyone's face on my screen. Um, so uh, I think most of you know that we were able to reopen for a few short weeks, June 19th through July 13th. The sports center was actually open and we kind of considered that a soft reopening in order to um, uh, try out our new policies and procedures um, to make sure that we had everything dialed in. And I have to say, I was so proud of our team and the planning that went into it because it actually went really, really well for those um, three weeks. Um, we met or exceeded all industry guidelines, which included um, requiring reservations 24 hours in advance. This was very challenging because our current software system couldn't support that functionality. Um, so I want to thank Shannon. She really helped us out and did research on some alternative reservation programs. Um, and we ended up going with Sign Up Genius. Um, and Shannon took that and ran with it 100%. Um, she did all the research. She got it set up, uh, trained us on how to use it, uh, helped train our, our members on how to use it that, uh, you know, is all new to everybody. And so um, that was great. And it worked out really well. Um, we did wellness checks upon entry. So we had a check-in table um, right at the entrance where we asked the um, mandatory questions. We took temperatures um, and really made sure that anyone coming into the facility cleared that wellness check. Um, we also created a contact, contactless check-in procedure um, so that our members and guests didn't have to touch any devices in order to check in. Um, I don't have a picture of it, but for those of you that are members or, or have come by, um, Pete Ramirez, our facility, senior facility attendant, built a really nice 
customized uh, plexiglass guard around our front desk, um, which functions very well and just looks looks beautiful. So that worked out really, really well. Um, we did require mask at all times. That was not a requirement of the guidelines at the time, uh, but um, we went ahead and made that a requirement. In the beginning, the first couple of days, we had some folks that didn't really like that, but I would say within probably 48 hours, people really um, adapted to that requirement and many really appreciated the requirement and thanked us for putting that in place. Um, and then of course, the increased cleaning and disinfecting that's required to stay safe and, and stay open. Um, our uh, facility attendant team, every single one of them had been laid off and uh, they agreed to come back in a part-time capacity to help us keep the facility clean and sanitized and disinfected and safe. Um, and it was just really that the three weeks of reopening was such a team effort. Um, Karen was there day one, helping us check people in. Uh, Shannon was helping with reservations. Diane was helping out with uh, technical support with our software system and customer service. And um, it really was a, a team effort. Um, right now, it's myself, Lori Tade, who's the group exercise coordinator, and Pete Ramirez, who's the senior facility attendant. We're the only three sports center staff. And so it has required um, the entire Parks and Recreation Department to come together and help us uh, be successful in opening. So I just want to shout out to everybody and say thank you. Um, during those three weeks that we were open, 379 members actually returned. Um, there were additional individuals that returned either through uh, a 10 visit pass or paying the drop-in fee. Um, but as far as actual members, 379 returned, 62% of those members are City of Monterey residents, 38% are non-residents. Um, we actually processed seven new memberships, which we were um, a little surprised at. I mean, it was so new and, and so much was going on with COVID and with reopening. Um, we were really surprised that we had seven new memberships, but we did. And I have to say, even now, I get phone calls all the time, people asking what... Um, when are we going to reopen? And when we do, what do our memberships look like? And um, and what are the fees? People are actually uh, excited about returning when we reopen. So that's really, really good news for us. Uh, during that three-week period, we had almost 4,000 people check in. Um, so while it is nowhere near where we used to be and um, felt very empty at times, uh, 4,000 check-ins is quite a bit for three weeks. Um, so we were happy about that. We averaged 202 guests a day. Uh, to put that in perspective, in all honesty, we probably average about 1,500 a day when uh, pre-COVID. So 202 seems low, but when you think about our population, our demographic, um, and how new all of this was to everybody, having 200 people come in a day, um, in hindsight, I think was a huge success. So we felt that that entire three week period was a success. We learned a lot from it and we're going to apply that as we move forward. And Andrea, that was with uh, minimum hours too. We didn't, we weren't open our full hours as well. Correct. If I remember right, I think we were open about 60 hours a week. Um, and typically we're open, uh, just over a hundred hours per week. So you're, you're right. Um, so since we closed in July, uh, we are allowed to operate outdoors. And so we have, um, started our outdoor group exercise classes. Uh, we offer 15 classes per week. Currently we're getting about 12 participants per class. Um, so in, since September 1st, when we started, we've, um, served 857 guests and we've generated almost $5,000 in net revenue. What's really great about this program is you do not have to be a member to participate, and we're seeing a pretty good mix of members and non-members paying basically the same drop-in fee for the classes. Um, really hoping we can retain those uh, drop-ins and, and convert them to memberships when we reopen, uh, but that program's been going very well. Um, I accidentally skipped over one bullet there, and that is um, while the conference center was serving as an evacuation uh, center, the sports center was asked to open um, for shower facilities. And so we didn't have a lot of takers, but the people that did want to take a shower while they were staying at the conference center really, really appreciated being able to come in and uh, take a really nice, hot private shower. And, and uh, so we were happy to, to serve in that capacity. 
Um, and I think next we just have some pictures of our outdoor group exercise classes. Um, this is Lori Tade, our amazing group exercise coordinator. She teaches uh, six classes a week. Uh, this is Matthew, one of our spin instructors, who is great. And Lori, again, she teaches a BOSU class that's very popular. We typically sell out of that class with about 17 people in there. And then I think we have some group shots coming up next, um, some of our participants. That was our functional strength class. This is one of our cycling classes. Um, and so that is ongoing. And so Lori and I are at the sports center every day. We are uh, setting up equipment three times a day on and off the sun deck. We're checking people in, we're sanitizing. Um, so that's going really well. Um, now we're looking at how to reopen and um, new specific guidelines have not come out yet. We don't know if there will be a change or not. They could be exactly the same. We just don't know. They haven't been published yet. Um, I've been spending time looking at gyms that are open. So I've done a few field trips to Santa Cruz County because they're open. And I'm looking at, um, you know, in shape and 24 hour fitness and Gold's Gym and um, the folks that are open to look at what are their hours of operation? What are their staffing and service levels look like? How have they laid out their equipment? Um, one thing we know is when we move into the next tier, tier two, which was the red tier, um, we can only open at 10% capacity. And so, um, again, going and talking to managers at other clubs and trying to figure out what that really means and, and how we're going to play that out. So, um, really planning for the next reopening. We learned so much the first time and we're going to implement um, a few changes based on that. And I think we'll open even stronger and better. Um, and then I'm really excited because uh, we do have a strategic planning meeting uh, on the books with um, city leadership. So we're really gonna be able to discuss kind of what, what the framework is and, and how we should be looking at reopening um, as we move forward. And I'm really excited about that. And I think that's it for me. So does it go back to Karen? Yes, thank you. So we just wanted to make sure that uh, the commission understands the framework that our department is working within and the city's priorities during the pandemic. So the city um, is focusing on maintaining public safety as our top priority. And so you, you guys will hear me, I'm sure you've heard me on the news and things like that about different decisions that we make. Um, our number one priority is, is safety. Um, keeping core city functions operational uh, across the board, you know, things are lean, but we all are keeping the city functioning and running and making sure that we're providing for our citizens. And you may have noticed if you've, if you've gone to some of our council meetings, uh, we've also been working towards a speedy recovery for all of our local industries, especially hospitality and small businesses, and working in partnership with them and doing whatever we can to facilitate their success uh, in, in getting through this pandemic. So what does the future hold? <laughs> and... How do we work towards a clear vision? This is something I grapple with. It is the million dollar question that um, we are struggling with as a team because the guidelines are changing all the time. Um, how do we develop a clear vision with the most uncertain time in our lifetime? A time that is laid in with the pandemic, a financial crisis, social justice movements, and then you compound that with wildfires and air quality uh, challenges. Uh, we would come to work and we never had to worry about that before, about air quality and do we have to require employees to wear masks and do we have to cancel classes? And um, we really had to be uh, very nimble in dealing with things on a day-to-day -day basis at times, sometimes hour to hour when it came to air quality. Uh, we never envisioned this situation to last this long. When this first happened and we all started working remotely and we had to start thinking about projecting what our revenues would be and that sort of thing, we never thought that this timeline uh, with these circumstances related to COVID-19 uh, would be have to be constantly reevaluated and adjusted for this many months. Uh, we know that rebuilding is going to take time 
and we will continue to concentrate on the positive outcome. You guys know and I've been with the city for a really long time. I have a vision of our recreation department as a multi-million dollar revenue generating machine that provides programs and services for people of all ages, from people as young as little infants under six months old up into people who are uh, 100 years old. So we're going to continue to focus on that positive income. We understand this is a marathon and we have to adjust our strategy and our pace um, as the terrain dictates. Uh, the continue, we'll continue to refine and focus on the vision uh, on the as the department um, as situations evolve as needed. Uh, we need to prepare for the new normal. Uh, one thing that is certain is the pandemic is unpredictable and we must remain flexible and pivot operations as necessary. Uh, as Andrea hinted at and, and Shannon and Louie, they're really great about this too. We spent a lot of time trying to collaborate with our our colleagues across the, the county, as well as into San Benito, as well as into um, Santa Cruz, uh, League of Cities through the state of California and NRPA. Uh, so we continue to watch the trends in our industry, as well as follow all the developing guidelines to mitigate COVID-19, including best pra practices in disinfecting and sanitizing, social distancing, and occupancy levels. That's a, a newer, um, uh, category for us, like even how to figure out occupancy, occupancy level per play structure. I never thought we'd have to be trying to figure out those types of things. Uh, we will need to recruit and retain volunteers. Our volunteers are amazing. You've seen how much they augment our services, just even this presentation. But we also have to be mindful of the limitations regarding personnel rules, safety, training, scheduling, and programming and uh, risk issues. So uh, we will continue to have a robust volunteer program, um, but we want to be mindful of all those other aspects as well. And we'll continue to pursue grants, partnerships, and private and nonprofit funding, and adjust programs and services as capacity allows. The department is lean, but we're mighty. And we continue to leverage the abilities we have in-house until resources permit our continued growth. Investing in technology, one thing that helps leverage our capacity is technology. And we would like to invest in technology and strive for a more user-friendly, automated, self-service online, on mobile devices, um, as effective, cost-efficient ways to connect with the public, as well as promote our programs and services. And we need to continue on service and cost recovery. Um, the Parks and Recreation Department has a long, history of service, and we intend to retain that legacy. However, we'll need to continue to pursue revenue sources and review all of our fees and charges and adjust as the market will bear. This is particularly challenging during this uncertain time. Um, certainly, uh, many of our important services that we provide right now, like blood drives and food distribution, uh, do not produce revenue, uh, but that does not decrease the value to the community. In addition, um, with diminished resources, fewer facilities, reduced occupancy, and less participants, uh, it makes it more difficult for us to achieve our cost recovery goals. But we're up to the challenge, and we'll continue to work together as a resilient and cohesive team to survive and conquer this age of COVID-19, and we will be stronger because of it. So uh, this concludes our presentation. Uh, so, we, uh, is it okay if we ask questions the, the, from the commission? I think, did they want to go to public comment first or do we um, do questions first, I think? I, I think we do public comment first. Okay, all righty. So, are there any anyone out there who'd like to comment publicly? Yeah, good evening, commissioners. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Nate Cota. I will be helping tonight with the public comment. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, we encourage members of the public to watch this broadcast on YouTube Live, which has a short delay of approximately 10 seconds. You can watch at youtube.com slash city of Monterey or on the YouTube app on Google Play or the Apple App Store to take public, public comment when viewers are watching live on YouTube or channel 25 See the announcement on, announcement on the Chiron, which is on the lower third of your screen. Please call the conference.
reference line by dialing area code 831-582-7500. Once you have entered the system, dial star five to raise your hand and you will be added to the queue to speak. Callers will be automatically muted until it is their turn to speak. We ask that callers please turn off their television or computer speakers or go to another room while connected by phone as any background noise will cause interference with the broadcast. I will call on each caller in the order of their hands raised and call out the last four digits of each caller's phone number before I unmute them. And please keep your comments to three minutes. So let me see if we do have any uh, public comment. And, and the, um, the phone number is 582-6500. So, there was oh, sorry if I said that wrong. Yep. No worries. 6500, and the Chiron is up, and I do not see any public comment, Madam Chair. If that, in that, in that case, I'm going to close public comments, and um, I'd open it up to commissioners to ask some questions that they'd like on the presentation. I have a few questions for Louie. Can you hear me? I can. I thought you would have some questions. I thought you thought I would have some questions. <laughs> Talk to me. <laughs> well, primarily, well, there's about three really, but primarily Lagunita Morada. Yes. So are they obliged to stop working tomorrow or today? End of business tomorrow. End of business tomorrow. And then are they scheduled to resume or is it going to stay that way for another year? Scheduled to resume next year at this point. So nothing between now and then. The lagoon won't be used for for um, drainage or it well it'll be it'll fill, fill up again in the wintertime. It'll okay. fill up great. So it'll look pretty good. Um, I wanna say that I'm not um, I'm not in control of that situation, but I do believe they're going to clean everything up around there before they leave. They only have to cease work inside the pond itself. Oh. So I'm assuming they're going to clean up the surrounding area, repour that concrete on the sidewalk, and then get out of there for a year and then come back. Wow. I understood it yesterday I, in talking with the engineers. So we'll have access to the park again. Yes, it should be all opened up. The pathway should be finished. Okay. Cleaned up. Yeah. Okay. But you're not going to be able to do any work there until the end of next year's. Not in the pond, but I can do some work around the pond. I could do some work in the trees, like pulling the ivy off the trees, trimming up the willow trees. I could do uh, aesthetic work around the outside of the pond. I just can't do anything inside the pond itself. I see. Okay, and the, uh, the the deadline, October 15th, was that due to um, nesting, nesting birds? I, I, I believe it was due to concerns about rain, and it had something to do with the filing process, and I'm not really sure what the hang-up was on that. Okay. Do you know how to find out? Um, I could try to find out. Uh, a little something. They were still a little unclear, unclear today because they were trying to get the final word today. They were trying for an extension. Mm. And it didn't happen. Um, so I could try to get somebody to give you a call and give you uh, better information than I can give you at this point on that. Okay, that'd be great. Just uh, yeah. being able to look for a vision of the future to see what's going on, that'd be helpful. Yeah, it's about seven feet deep right now. They wanted to make it nine feet deep. Yeah. And um, they're about three quarters of the way through it, uh, not to the proper depth, but at least three quarters of the way through it with removal. Perfect. Are they, or do they still have the mud up at uh, Ryan Ranch? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That can be moved at any time. That's not in. Uh, that's not on a time frame. All right. Well, thank you. And so I have a question about Veterans Park too. Mm -hmm. How are you doing the uh, facing and? and the CDC guidelines up there. So we try to get into um, the bathrooms more often with disinfectant. Um, we try to disinfect anything that is touched. We have the group areas that are closed. They can't be used. 
Um, we try to emphasize uh, social distancing as far as uh, table use and stuff like that around the campsites. And the same number of campsites are open as before? Yes. Okay. Um, Shulchi Park looks beautiful, I can tell you that. Thank you. And, uh, I, oh, I have a question. The skateboard park, skateboard park seems to be open. Yes. Any guidelines there? Not really. Uh, we have signs up there saying social distancing. We really, you know, we really don't have the staff to police that. Um, but uh, we have signs up saying, uh, I believe we limit it to 20. And you can check me if I'm wrong on that. But I thought we did the square footage there and, and try to do the square footage and what's going to be allowed in there at the time. I think we, it was, I believe, for the size of the skate park. Um, I do not go by it that much. So I haven't seen a lot of activity there. So I think on the weekends, it might be a little more popular than what I haven't seen much activity during the week. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lily, I had a question for you. Uh, on the transient camps, are they localized to any Pacific area or are they, are they everywhere? It's mostly been the beach, uh, Don Dabby. Um, not, not so much Iris Canyon right now, uh, but uh, I'd say Don Dabby and the beach. The beach has been a pretty popular spot. So the Capitol site hasn't been an issue? It's actually been pretty good. It's good. actually been pretty good, yeah. Good, okay. And I had a question for, for Justin. It's not really a question, I guess. It's I love the story about this kid that got the trees planted instead of birthday presents. I mean, that's a real good news story. It'd be nice to get a little publicity on that. Yeah, she was actually an adult. Um, uh, so she had her kids and stuff there. But yeah, it was really good. Um, I I was skeptical at first. I wasn't sure how it was going to work out, but it, it came together pretty well. So it was a, it was a good idea. I like um, funding's tight for everything now. So people you know, putting in money to help plant trees and then doing the planting themselves is... You know, helpful and it, it was kind of good at a time where we can't get together very often. I think it just it encourages citizens to, you know, basically be involved. And I think it's a good it's a good news story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Lacey. I want to make sure can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. I wanted to comment on just uh, just wonderful to see this presentation and hear about all the great volunteerism that's happening in our city, because I think sometimes it's, it feels like there's not a lot going on because we're all so disconnected. So I wanted to know for those who feel like they want to be more connected and serving, how do they sign up for either um, volunteering and gardening or volunteering and food distribution? I'm not sure who can answer that for me, but. So uh, for volunteering in parks, um, you would call parks 646-3860 um, um, and go um, and get squared away with that, um, Louie. And um, is Tice the one who's handling that, Louie, coordinating volunteers in parks? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. And then... Um, produce distribution, we're, we're not screening new volunteers quite yet. We, we have the existing volunteers that have been fingerprinted and gone through that process. Um, we are evaluating um, what, um, what that would look like in the future if we were to have some volunteers. Um, it is a lot of work. Um, it is requires some really heavy lifting and physical abilities. So, um, and, you, and we need someone who's going to be consistent and show up because um, when you have reservations for 350 people, um, you need to be able to provide that food for 350 people on that day. Yeah. So. That's great. Thank you, right. Shannon. Sure. Um, a couple other questions. I'll try to go as quick as I can. Sure. Um, for the parks reopening, I know Karen and I had emailed a little bit about this, but I've had a couple people ask why um, cities that are nearby have open parks, but Monterey has not. And my answer has just been that Monterey has more parks in general than some of our neighborhood cities or neighboring cities. But I wondered if there was more information that would be useful for me to share when asked that question. Sure, sure. Uh, when I talk with other cities, 
First of all, they may not have as many playgrounds as we do. So I always like to make sure that I clarify that our parks are open. It's just the actual play structures that are closed. Um, the biggest hurdle for us is actually following the guideline of disinfecting and sanitizing high touch areas daily. And we, that's just something we don't have the resources for, uh, for the amount of playgrounds and play structures that we have. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is providing um, hand sanitizer um, and hand washing stations at each one of our sites. So other locations may either A, have more resources, B, um, have a, a higher risk tolerance for certain guidelines. Uh, if it says something like as practicable, they may be more comfortable with in that gray area than perhaps our city is. Um, and also they may have fewer playgrounds. So it just makes it a little easier for them if they only have one or two or a handful of playgrounds versus um, how many sites that we have. Um, when you also compare that to the amount of resources that we have at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. Um, really quick, I want to give a shout out to Montana for his great cooking videos. I, I just love the spirit behind that. I think it's amazing for, I think he's a high school student. Is that right? I love to see high school students do things like that. It's so great. I um, also want to thank the California Beach Volleyball Association for their involvement in getting those courts um, done. And I wanted to know if that space is something that would be programmable for parks or sports center. Would that be a benefit to us? I think Shannon first. I'm not sure who should answer that, but so um, it it's definitely something that we can permit group use, and definitely um, now that we've got four courts, um, probably once that's allowed to be reopened, generate some good revenue um, because our previous um, previously we only had one net on one court, so to have four amazing courts um, that we can rent out for blocks of time every day and have multiple people on. I think that's going to be huge. Um, if you go down to Carmel Beach and see what they did to those volleyball courts at the down, uh, very bottom of Ocean Avenue, it's really revitalized that area and gets a lot of different people in. Um, and so there's potential for some beach volleyball um, classes starting at MPC and CSUMB and lots of great activities. Um, it's also going to be good for um, several of our special events that we have every year, the sports fest and the volleyball tournaments. Um, so I think it's going to be um, great once we're able to um, really reopen those courts and, and have people mixing um, safely. Mm -hmm. okay. um, that's yeah. That's it. And, sorry. And we do have um, beach volleyball camps normally every summer ourselves. Thank you, Shannon. Sure. Thank you. I just had a question for Karen. You know, if if you know, going back to Lucy's point about people asking about playgrounds being open, is it worthwhile posting some information about that so people don't understand? You know, people don't understand. I mean, I, I think the reasons you gave for why they're not open yet make perfect sense, but the public may not be aware of that. Sure. Uh we can reconsider how we're advertising it. We did talk to the media quite a bit with KION and the Herald and KSBW, and, and, um, but they don't seem to be as interested in those particular pieces. Um, I would try to make it clear and kind of emphasize what the reasons were, and I would talk about resources, and they would just kind of focus on lack of staff and talk about what people could do to use the park safely as far as you know, having adults supervise and encourage them to wear masks and encouraging kids to social distance. Um, but they didn't uh, seem to be as compelled to cover the portion about um, some of the guidelines that were required to follow as an agency. And if I could just add uh, briefly, uh, Karen uh, responded so well on, on, on this question. From the city manager's office perspective, we've taking a much more cautious approach to how we reopen our facilities and how we operate a facility citywide. We were the first city in the county to announce the closure of our community centers, of the sports center and our libraries. We were also the first city in the county and in fact, one of the first in the entire state to issue the emergency uh, order on face coverings, making them mandatory with, with fines. 
and it also means that when we reopen, we, we also take a, a little bit more cautious of an approach. The statewide, just because the state allows uh, for uh, playgrounds to reopen doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do at, at this time, especially in this county where we have uh, widespread COVID uh, numbers. So um, that's the other piece that I would also reiterate is that we're still, it's still widespread. We still have, uh, and even though it's allowed doesn't mean that we should, uh, and we're taking a more cautious approach, but uh, we'll revisit it once we get out of the widespread uh, category and go from purple to red and see whether or not we can uh, open up some of the neighborhood playgrounds. The state CDPH guidelines, the California Department of Public Health also made it very clear that these are supposed to be neighborhood playgrounds that are within a half of a mile of residents. So playgrounds like Dennis the Menace Park, which serve the region, uh, wouldn't have been allowed to reopen if we wanted to have it reopen. That's also another point uh, to, to share as well. So just wanted to offer that uh, perspective from my seat. So any other any other questions, comments from the commission? Yeah, this is Dennis, can you hear me? Uh, Follow-up question, just on the ballpark advertising. Um, I'm just curious, because I don't remember the resolution of that, because I know there was some disagreement and it's gonna go to the, to the um, city council on uh, December 1, if I heard correctly. I mean, is there now an agreement that's been reached between uh, the city and the, um, you know, the high school folks in the Pony League about how that advertising is going to work? Hi, um, I don't think we are at 100% agreement. I think their one sticking point is um, the ability for the advertising to either be year round or seasonal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the one thing that we have not come to agree on, and we're gonna have to let the city council make that decision. Um, right now, you know, even now with COVID and what's happened with the city rec, uh, parks and rec budget, um, you know, we might need to consider advertising ourselves. So, um, you know, Monterey High allows for seasonal advertising by sport by season. And that's still our recommendation is that uh, Monterey High softball and baseball and the Pony Leagues um, sell advertising by, for the season, basically January through May. Um, but again, it will be up to city council to make that decision. Okay, so that's that's basically the sticking point that's going to go to the council for determination other than our recommendation versus, well, I guess the, the, the other components then are generally have been agreed upon except for that point. Correct, yes, everything. The um, I think we came down to a $75 fee per sign per park, um, and all the other um, stipulations have been um, agreed to, negotiated. Well, then just kudos, because that's not an easy negotiation with the folks that are involved. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> that's it for me. Hello, this is Ellen. I just, uh, can you hear me? Good. Yeah. I just uh, wanted to say hello to everybody and it's been a long time and um, it's so delightful to see you all and hear everything that you've been doing, all these incredibly creative ways to serve the community. And um, it's very encouraging because, you know, this is sort of a, you might call it kind of a bleak time. And um, it sort of restores my my faith in humanity a bit to to know all these good things that are going on. It's it's easy to get a little um, a little down about it all. So thank you from a personal level and as someone who's you know thinking about COVID all the time, it's very nice to to have this as a refreshing outlook. Thank you. And I guess I'd, I'd second that. I mean, I'm amazed how dedicated you guys are. I mean, it's keeping spirits up and having activities to do. And, and look, Lucy's got a child there. <laughs> Anyhow, any other comments? If not, let's continue on with, the, uh, with our agenda. Um, 
I'd like to call for approval of the minutes uh, from our last meeting, which was hard to believe, but was June 10th. Hopefully you've had a chance to review them. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, hearing none, would someone, would a commissioner like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there any further discussion? Mama. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> so is there anyone there in the public that would like to comment to the Parks and Rec Commission on any item that wasn't on our agenda for tonight? Uh, Nate, is there anybody there? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, uh, just as a reminder, if, if any general public want to make any general public comment, please dial 831-582-6500 and hit star five to raise your hand to be added to the queue to speak. Let me see if we have anyone for general public comment. We have no one um, for general public comment. Okay, public comments are now closed. I guess I'd like to call on staff now, starting with Karen, as to uh, any other comments you wanna make. No, no, just basically wanna make sure I say thank you to the entire team. They have to be so flexible every single day, sometimes hour by hour, and uh, they can work some very long hours and very long weeks sometimes, and they always do it with a really positive attitude, uh, and very much a can-do attitude as well. So I really appreciate about that about them. I also wanna thank you for your support and your dedication to us. I know every time that I send an update to you, um, we've always been very responsive with either terrific feedback or guidance, and good questions too. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, we really appreciate it. Shannon, any other comments? Uh, no, I just wanted to say um, that this wouldn't have been possible without um, all of the staff in recreation. There's only four of us um, in the recreation division, but we do um, some pretty amazing things. And it, you know, every one of them works so hard every single day. Um, we're Diane's helping with produce distribution. She's helping with Meals on Wheels. Nate is working tireless, tirelessly. It's just it's great um, to work with everyone, and um, you know I can't thank my staff enough. Um, and it's great to work with the sports center and support them and parks and everything. We're just we're just um, really hoping to get back to some sort of normal. But I really just have to, I just have to thank my staff because it's just, they're just amazing. And um, it, we couldn't um, have made it past the past six months without all of them. So um, I just need to really acknowledge Nate and Rachel and Diane. Um, and Nate has just, is just been so great with EOC and Karen Shelter and all of those things. So I need to give Nate, um, you know, and, and making our cooking videos in, in addition to all of that. So um, I just need to make sure I, I acknowledge all the staff. So thank you. Great, Andrea, I can't wait to get in the pool again. <laughs> and you're the not, room. <laughs> you're not the only one. That's probably the number one question I am asked every single day. Um, when is the pool gonna open? So we're all excited for that. Um, I just want to echo uh, the same sentiments as Shannon and Karen. I'm so proud to be part of this team. Um, the Sports Center team has been amazing. Lori and Pete are wonderful to work with. We're all, uh, you know, we've, we've really come together and, and become much closer um, over this time because we are working in a different way together. Um, and um, even our group exercise instructors, you know, part-time instructors that are coming in and teaching for 45 minutes, they have so much enthusiasm and positivity and um, they just are always asking what they can do, you know, to help out and, and what else can we be doing to be serving our community. And so um, even though these are very challenging times, um, it 
still feels very positive at the sports center. Um, and again, just really want to thank, um, the entire department. I mean, Louie was out at the sports center the other day because our, um, our, uh, birds of paradise out on the sun deck are not doing too well because, you know, we're not used to having to take care of that on top of everything else. Um, so, you know, really the department has come together and continues to come together. Um, and I appreciate the support from everybody. Um, it's just, it's made this difficult time really um, a lot more manageable. So thank you to everyone. And Louie, any other comments? You're muted, Louie. I'm just saying, yeah, I just want to say that we've been going about our business, um, doing the beach cleanups and the transient cleanups and, and that stuff. And I just want to make a special comment out to uh, about the fuel reduction and the green belts. I don't think they've ever looked better at this time of year. Um, we're really just on the cusp of fire season right now, but they're really look nice. Even if you drive by old capital site, all up Iris Canyon road, Don Dabby, they really look good. So anyway, that's all my comments. Uh, commissioners, you, anybody who wants to start, just meet, unmute yourself and get make your comment. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank the staff again. I, I, it's such a privilege to be a part of this commission and be a part of what's making Monterey um, not just survive but thrive through this time. And just want to thank you guys for all your effort. And uh, I also want to say thank you and echo Louis' comments on the fuel reduction. I live in a neighborhood where we're very close to a lot of trees. And uh, we actually went and watched the goats for quite a bit with my kids and enjoyed uh, watching all that wonderful fuel reduction happen in our neighborhood. So thank you for, for doing such a good job and getting us um, to this point in the fire season. Really appreciate it. Dennis, you want to speak comment? Just to just to echo what what Lacey said, and that is, you know, it's just very impressive to hear one the dedication, but two the ability to execute on get things done, uh, because it's hard to maintain one's um, verve and drive, et cetera, in these times. So I'm just very impressed with the staff and the way things are happening, and um, you know, again, I, I'm sure I speaking for all of the commissioners, but if there's anything you can have us help do, you know, whether it's you need volunteers or whatever, I'm sure every one of us would love to step up and do it. Um, so that's really what I've got to say. So thank you. Shelby. Oh uh, yeah, just thanks. It's very easy to feel disconnected these days. So it's great to see everyone and get up to date on what everyone's doing. And thanks so much for all your hard work, really. And Christian? Yeah, it's repeat on all the, the love fest and thank yous. Uh, you guys are the gold at the end of this COVID rainbow. And um, we we all need to have that um, hope and, and, and think about uh, those goals. So thanks for keeping those goals alive. And uh, I really appreciate all the work you guys are doing behind the scenes and in front of us right now. Thank you. And Ellen? Well, bravo to Parks and Rec <laughs> and stay safe, stay well. And, you know, we're, we're looking at a vaccine down the road and maybe, maybe next year will be a little bit better than this year. That's, that's where we're going. Thanks. And I, and obviously I can't reach my light switch in this room or I, I'm, I'm turning into the darkness, so I have to hurry up. But uh, Nate, one thing I'd like to add is just, I hope the city council uh, you could pass on to the city council how much we appreciate the service, the community service that Parks and Rec is doing with such a small staff. I mean, it's amazing what they've been able to do. And and I echo Dennis's comments. If there's anything else we can do, please let us know. I mean, Louie, I even volunteer for extra time pulling weeds, you know. If it and, um, and the only other comment I'd add is at some point, Lily, I want to share some ideas with maybe increasing volunteers in parks, but I'll just send that to you directly. Oh, let there be light. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Our next meeting is November 9th at 5.30. I'm guessing it will also be virtual. And I'll look forward to seeing you guys then. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe. Take and care. With that, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>